You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the day, or maybe a gratitude nugget, and how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one to three takeaways from today's show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning. It's downloaded at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and other places where you get podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I appreciate that. And also to purchase a gratitude journal to find out more about my gratitude coaching or speaking, you can contact me at thatgratitudeguy.com as well as thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on to the most important part of the show, and that is my guest. And my guest today is Rich Stillman, which is currently CEO of Calabra, putting all his years of running and growing companies to work, helping businesses, business owners grow their businesses much faster. Over the past 30 years, Rich has worked as CEO, COO, and VP marketing sales in large companies and entrepreneurial settings alike. He's founded for-profit and non-profit organizations, and as president, helped Coinstar grow from $80 million to $500 million in just over five years. That's quite impressive. Rich and his wife, Julie, have two daughters and a fabulous dog. And of course, the, the daughters are pretty cool too. He graduated from Babson College and has an MBA from Columbia University, where he is also was also an adjunct professor. Rich, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here with you. Thank you. Great to have you here. And the thing I always, for anybody that listens to me for any length of time, I always start off with, how did we become acquainted as to the best of your knowledge? Yeah, well, so you and I are both friends uh, mutually with a woman named Ella Malco Moore, mm-hmm. and uh, she uh, discovered that you and I lived in contiguous towns and thought that it might be a great idea for us to get together, and we did, and when we did, we discovered that we had a lot in common, not just the exposed part of our head, but a bunch of other really important things as well. Now that you mentioned it, it does look kind of like a salt and pepper shaker. That's pretty true. We look like I got this the images side by side. <laughs> so well, one of the things I noticed when I met you too is I, one of the terms I've always liked is like-minded. And I think about a lot of the people, I'll ask people from time to time, where does your motivation come from? And there's some people that are so motivated and some that aren't. And this shows up by people that, of course, that are. But if, for instance, I want, I want to definitely talk about your Coinstar experience, but I want you to go back and kind of talk a little bit about how your journey started, because how people get motivated to do the things that you've done, and certainly if gratitude played a part in there, that's fine as well. But really, what was kind of the early journey for Rich Stillman when you first got, got started? Uh, well, let me see if I could try not make this take the... 60 odd years. Yeah. So the first part of my career was working in New York City in advertising. I'd grown up in the New York City area, uh, got a job after college, right in advertising. I spent about 20 years in the advertising business. And um, the short form of the story is that around age 40, I I basically had a midlife crisis and ended up, uh, I had a wife who worked out on Wall Street, two young daughters at that point in time. And we basically picked up and moved to Seattle in uh, the mid nineties where we knew absolutely no one Mm. and just sort of recreated our lives. Um, uh, And for me in many ways, uh, you know, that's that the segment of my life that's come after that has been where all the personal growth has come from, mm. uh, and a realization that that uh, I am presented with uh, what I would call blessings every day, and um, and I have just come to prize those, you know, both events and people, um, and so over time, 
expressing gratitude, feeling gratitude, uh, and viewing the world through that lens has become a very important part of not only what I'm trying to do as a person, but also the work that I do with clients to help them grow their businesses faster. Um, uh, gratitude and expressing gratitude is a very important part of the framework that we use to help our clients. Excellent. And I think, too, one of the things, gratitude is such a big part of it. And but I also think the five regrets of the dying, I bring this up on podcasts every so often because I think it's very instructive. And they had a survey of all these people that are 90 and 95 and they had the five regrets. And one of them was, I wish I'd lived the life more true to myself than what others had expected for me. So if I apply that template to Rich Stillman and I go back to roughly at 40 years old, a midlife crisis, what, what kind of was the genesis of that? Did you, was it one day you woke up all of a sudden and said, you know what, honey, we're moving to Seattle. I've had it with this stuff. Or did it happen a little bit by, you know, a brick at a time? Because the reason I ask is I think it'd be interesting to hear anyway, but also because so many people think that, but they never do it and they stay and they lead these lives of quiet desperation. So what was the process for you when you had that big change from New York to Seattle? The, it, it, it accumulated over time and then it kind of reached critical mass, to be honest with you. Um, and it was really just a feeling that, I, you know, kind of like a midlife crisis. If this is what it's going to be for the next 25 years, I'll explode. I can't, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the opportunity for me anyway was, a, was one of kind of recreation in a way. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to kind of re reinvent myself professionally a few times since then. Um, you know, so there was a startup in there, uh, a couple of different startups, a small one, one that was uh, that was really taking off, very successful. The Coinstar experience was, I mean, talk about a blessing. The opportunity to work with people like Carol Lewis and Diane Renahan and Dan Garrity, who were who were there at that time, just unbelievably lucky for me, and I learned a ton from. Uh, all of the employees of Coinstar, but but certainly those three, uh, you know. And then from there, I went on to run a couple of other companies and started a couple of consulting firms. And and now I'm at the point now where uh, you know I work with a limited set of clients, and they're heroes in my eyes. Uh, luckily, I guess they feel like I'm adding value to them, but but of course I feel like I'm getting far more back from them in return. And so it's, you know, it's a, it's a really exciting life. Um, and the personal side feeds the professional side at this point in time. So um, I'm at a stage where I, I just really feel awesome about what I'm doing. I look forward to every day when I, when I wake up. Which I think is, I knew that from a previous conversation that you and I had, and I just think that's fantastic. Uh, it's like what makes people happy. And if people aren't happy, they should do something about it. And some people don't. And that's why I say the regrets of the dying. I wish I'd taken sure. more chances. I wish I'd taken yeah. better care of myself, things like that. Yeah. Pretty yeah. typical. It's instructive. But I think that, again, a lot of people don't do it. But what has made now making you the happiness? Is it the relationship with the clients? Is it doing what you love? What, what has made this work so much more appealing to you and rewarding than the previous things? I... Uh, over time, I have really locked on to what I think my purpose is. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge believer for businesses, having a mission statement and a purpose statement is important. It's equally important for, for individuals. And mine, uh, from a business standpoint, revolves around the fact that the current state of business is really set up. The rules are, are built for big business. Right. Big business is going to get bigger. It is getting bigger. The data supports it. And meanwhile, a third of U.S. GDP is in small businesses. And there are millions and millions of small businesses who were created by people like my clients who are just wonderfully talented folks. They're not getting venture capital. They just they have a great idea and they start a business literally on their kitchen table. And uh, and I think that those people need access to the same types of really bright ideas and thinking that business, big businesses can buy from 
consulting firms like Bain and McKinsey, et cetera, right? right? But where does the little business go to get those kind of ideas? What, what I think I offer without patting myself on the back too much is I've, I've been a part of really rapidly growing big businesses. I've also started small businesses. I have a unique perspective and I can curate the best of the, of the thinking that works for big businesses. I can translate it to make, have it make sense for the small business owner and thereby arm them to the teeth with, with all that great stuff so that their businesses can grow. And if, if their businesses grow, then it unlocks a whole bunch of dreams for them and their family and their communities. And when you aggregate that at the societal level, you know, you, you can make a big chunk of GDP grow rapidly. Everybody wins in that case. So that, that purpose uh, motivates me and it gives, and, and every day now with this business that I've built, I have the opportunity to live into that and, and try and be a part of helping all of these businesses across the company work better. That is so cool. I, I'm always going to write down, we'll have a few nuggets to take away from Rich today. Um, you were locked onto your purpose, you said, and rules are built for bigger business, which I totally agree with. And if rules are built for bigger business and you've got, yet you've got all these small businesses that are out there that could use Rich's help and, and other consultants and so forth, just for the, for the listener that might be curious, what are the, maybe the top one or two or three things that those small businesses need because they're getting stepped on by all the, the resources that are available for bigger business? What are maybe the top one or two or three things that they need that either you provide them or that they figure out a way to get with your help or that make a difference for them being the small fish in the big pond? Well, uh, part of it is what I call the core strategy. So what is the source of your competitive advantage? Mm. And, uh, and in my view, not enough businesses do, it, it's, a, it's a heavy lift in terms of the approach and the thought process. So, but really locking into whatever that is so that, so that there is a, when you develop your messaging, there's a consistent message that, that applies. Mm. Really being focused on a target audience. That's the hardest thing. Mm to really select a, a very small slice of the market, because let's face it, no business has unlimited resources, but the small business is, is especially resource constrained. And then, uh, you know, to, to get back to where you live, David, it's how you build the culture of the organization. And in a lot of small businesses, you know, the owner is busy, he or she's, you know, chief cook and bottle washer, there's a lot of stuff going on. But how you build the culture of accountability, how you build uh, the culture of creativity and innovation, how you build the culture that serves customers absolutely as, you know, top notch fashion, that, that culture can emanate, uh, I believe, starting from this uh, cornerstone of of identifying and expressing gratitude. Mm. So I, those for me would be the, the three key things, right? I really have a strong core strategy, uh, really identify your target audience and then build your culture with a cornerstone of gratitude. Build a core culture. And one of the things, Rich, I hear a lot about that um, I, I think I'm somewhat aware of, but I, again, just maybe to clarify, What's the best way, I'm sure there's many things, but maybe the top couple ways that a company identifies their target market. It's, it's a whittling down process. So we, you know, uh, we use a tool called an ideal customer profile where you basically, you set out criteria that seem to typify your best customers. You know, as any business, you could take a look at who your customers are. I mean, maybe you've had this with your own clients, David, but some end up being better relationships, better experiences for you and for them mm -hmm. than others. Why is that? And you try and understand what the differences are. Why do some customer relationships go really well, very easily, very profitably for you? And, and why do some not work out quite that way? And, and in that, you can start to understand the particular groups of people or segments of people for whom your service really sinks. They really value what you offer. Um, and, uh, and, and they consume it in such a way that it allows you to, to be profitable as opposed to spending a lot of money trying to please somebody that inherently is just not a good fit for your product or service. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so you figure out what those criteria are, and then you can basically score uh, your current customers and use that as a guide for when you're talking with new prospects, you can identify whether they're going to fall into a bucket where, Hey, it looks like they're, they're likely fit the profile of what could be a great customer experience, or maybe they're not. And if they're not, Frankly, you're better off failing fast and just saying, listen, I don't think I'm going to be the right fit for you. Uh, let me recommend a different place for you to go to help solve your problem. And so with right? a lot of things, it's going to take some time. That's not something you're going to do overnight. You mail out one profile and you get back a few responses or something. But I think it certainly would take some time. But once you identify that target market, gosh, it's that, that like ready, aim, fire, aim, ready, fire, whatever that was. But at least you know who you're going after, or who the person right. is and things. And right. so- Right. And, and speaking of uh, going after, I, I think there's lifelong, I said, when I met you and I just was so impressed with you and I thought, God, what a like-minded guy. And he's just got all this energy and he's got all this drive. And he's had this great experience. And I've always believed there's lifelong learners and there's know-it-alls. And I've met a couple of know-it-alls in my life and I, I can't even talk about it. It's just so dis <laughs> disappointing to talk to people that just have the answers for everything and really have the answers for none. But being yeah. somebody who's a lifelong learner as you are, you mentioned several key people at Coinstar, and I think a lot of the listeners will be very familiar with Coinstar. I certainly am and have been and was a customer for a long time and so on. But you mentioned three or four key people that you learned. What were some of the key things that you learned from them that you think are takeaways as you look back on that experience as president? Um, and I, and the, other, the other person worth mentioning is the founder, Jens Mulbach. So it, uh, obviously he I, had a large hand in this too, but you know, I got to the company uh, in 2000, so it had already been in business for for five years or so, maybe more, and had been public for three or four years. Um, and they had built an awesome culture, and did a. I remember uh, Diane Renahan. She joined a few months after I did, and you know, she would send out an email to the senior team that would just sort of inform us about something that she had done. And she would get back a torrent of emails. Way to go, awesome job, that's wow. really cool from all of us. And she, uh, as we were getting to know each other, she came to me one day and said, what, what the heck is going on? Like, this is, this is like uh, unnatural behavior. I've never had anybody do this oh, before. Funny. And I said, yeah, well, welcome to Coinstar. This is just the way that it works. We, we root for each other. Uh, we pull for each other, and and that was that was just the tone that was set by, like I said, folks like Dan and Carol, who had been there uh, almost from the beginning, and and Jens, and and then you know that culture was then passed on to uh, to the subsequent layer of leadership, which included Diana and myself. So, um, and you're right, David, that it that it's built brick by brick over time. You know, unfortunately, it's very easy to destroy it, but it but it takes a long time, a lot of, of very conscious work to be able to to uh, build that properly. So, but boy, once you do, you get a well aligned, you get a well aligned culture that's built on that type of expression of gratitude, and uh, what it what it does organizationally is it builds resilience inside the organization it makes people very optimistic about the outcome, that everybody believes in a bright future. And so they're willing to, to walk through walls to make stuff happen. And when you run into the natural obstacles that are gonna occur, you've got all this, this built up perseverance to be able to muscle through that and get to the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that's what separates the truly great organizations from the ones that struggle. So. Well, and you mentioned too, that's the culture and that she was a little bit, what's all these emails that are coming back in and so forth. And that's not typical and so on. Mm -hmm. I mentioned mm -hmm. you uh, prior to starting the podcast about, I was listening to a podcast and they mentioned this studies, which I'd heard before, but it was just a good reminder. And it's a perfect segue into my next question for you. When they said studies have shown that when an employer expresses gratitude for their employees, not only do the employees not take their foot off the gas pedal, but typically they redouble their efforts and work even harder. And I found that in running Nordstrom stores and Lowe's and things like this. And boy, if you're just nice to people and so on. But, but speaking of that, so that culture at Coinstar, and then certainly for the clients that you uh, have right currently, 
mention for the listeners the two or three things that employees really want in a job. You mentioned it to me earlier, but let's let's have you bring that up again for the benefit of the listeners because I think that's so critical that uh, what they're really looking for deep down inside. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, in all of the the research that I've done, uh, there's a lot of intersecting uh, stuff. So one piece of it for me anyway is is Daniel Pink's book called Drive, where he talks about the three things that people want that really gets them into their job and makes them want to perform well is number one, autonomy, number two, mastery, and number three, connecting to the purpose. So that, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, Gallup has a series of engagement questions that are used in employee engagement surveys around the world. And they, uh, they also have applied this to trying to, to train and develop managers. Um, they, uh, unfortunately for me, they wrote a book about it about six months after I started already practicing that, right? But the idea is that if, if these are the things that motivate employees, if you're the manager and you, and you uh, manage your people in such a way that they would rate you very highly on those 12 things, mm -hmm. then almost by definition, you're doing a great job. Well, what are the highlights in those 12 engagement questions? Someone, uh, someone seems to care about me as a person. Someone's taken an interest in my development. I've gotten feedback on my, on my performance in the past seven days. I have a best friend at work. Um, what that means is that the role of the manager is a very active one. And when it's best practiced, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the role of trying to catch people in the act of doing something good so that you can comment on it and thank them. Right now, along the way, you want to connect them to the purpose of the organization, because back to, to Daniel Pink, they want, to, they want to be connected to something that's bigger than themselves. But, but that's kind of what Coinstar did, right? Coinstar pioneered a whole new way of dealing with a, a, a really pervasive problem, if you will, what people do with their spare change. Um, and we had this, this can-do attitude that got built up brick by brick through this succession of leadership uh, and, and uh, you know, constantly rooting for our joint success. And, and then that's what happens. You know, I mean, you get businesses that grow fivefold, eightfold in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, I mean, it's just incredibly exciting to be a part of it. Now I'm part of a, I'm helping a company right now, a client who's got a, an inside sales operation in the Philippines that has grown from 10 people to over hundred people in the past 15 months. Wow. Around the same basic model of teamwork, collaboration, gratitude. And, uh, and that has been as exciting as the time that I spent at Coinstar. It's been absolutely unbelievable. And all it does empirically is prove that the thing that like Brene Brown, I believe was the author of the quote that you read, right. Brene Brown, Daniel Pink, um, Stephen Covey, we're all talking about the same basic thing. People wanna be recognized, they wanna make a contribution, it, uh, right? They wanna to connect to something bigger. And when you do all those things together and you do them well, thank you for doing a great job. I really like what you do this. Let's not forget that Constructive criticism plays a larger role in that as well. Uh, but in any event, the more, the more gratitude that's expressed, the more recognition for people's contribution, the more we can connect that contribution to the higher purpose of the organization. Brene is right. People will redouble their efforts. They will, and they will enthusiastically put the pedal to the metal. It's awesome. It's awesome to watch. It's interesting, the, had some surveys done back in the 80s, and it was, just as you said, appreciation, recognition. Um, a couple of things they had way back when was help with personal problems and being in on the know. So they, you had the inside knowledge and knowing that we're going to expand or what have you. And then when they did the same survey, this is right in line with what you're saying, a couple of years ago, appreciation, recognition was still there. But number three was responsibilities. Number two was goals. And number one was purpose. 
And you yeah. think about now, and I, I, the millennials get a lot of junk for some of the things and beliefs that they have, but there's a lot of things that I really look at and I think, wow, like go do your traveling now. Why wait until you're 60 until you may not be around or like where you and I are or whatever. And do you yeah. really need a car? Or can you just take Uber or what have you? So there's a lot of things that we can learn from that, but that purpose is so important. And and I think wherever, and especially the gratitude piece, which is my centerpiece, but but the appreciation recognition, what is wrong with showing, why, why is somebody fearful of that? I mean, like the person said, like Brene Brown said, the studies that showed originally, the people thought, well, now they'll goof off. They'll work half as hard because they're, they're getting complimented on something. And I remember an a interaction I had with my father probably 40 years ago when uh, we were in this room and my, his brother, my uncle was asking me about my airplane. He had an airplane. I flew up to see my brother at this family reunion. It was Thanksgiving or Christmas or something. And I leave the room and Uncle Phil says to my dad, well, Bob, you sure must be proud of David. And I, I'm in the other room now, but I could hear. And he goes, well, I am. I just don't want him to know. <laughs> and I just, you're the one guy I would like to know. You're my dad. I'd like you to be right. proud of me. And right. Yeah. I, my younger son always says to me, dad, I just want you to be proud of me. And I said, I stole that line. But it, it's so important. But, but Rich, if, it, if you go back, we've probably got about five more minutes. If you go back to Coinstar, again, 80 million to 500 million, and maybe you've answered this, but for the man on the street or the woman on the street that says, now, wait a second, Rich, in five years, you took it from 80 to 500. What would be your short answer to them in terms of, of what? Because people are always looking for the magic pill or the magic wand or something, but that's pretty impressive growth to, growth, to say the least. But what would you tell the average person that was asking about that great success? Well, I think, well, first of all, like I, like I said, uh, let's, let's be humble here. Uh, there was an awesome business model that was already in place. Mm -hmm. um, I think I added value to it. I, I was the guy that, that helped add, uh, when I started, Coinstar accepted change and produced a, a little paper receipt that you could turn back into cash. Right. And my contribution was to try and accept all forms of currency and distribute different forms of currency. Mm -hmm. So we introduced physical gift cards, electronic gift cards. We greatly expanded the ability to donate change through the Coinstar machine to an expanded series of, of nonprofits. You know, make that machine uh, more uh, relevant to people as opposed to just taking change and converting it back into dollar bills. Right. And I think those two things together, an established business model that we that we really refined and, and, and finessed and improved uh, together with expanding the strategic definition of what we were in business to do, I think is are those two are things I think were were of major importance in helping to fuel the company's growth. So that tells me when I went up to the Coinstar machine one day and put my big, huge bag of coin in there, and it said, you have the option to get a Starbucks card, which I spend a lot of time at. I didn't know it, but I eventually would be running into and becoming good friends with the person that figured that whole thing out. I went, oh my gosh, a Starbucks card. Are you kidding me? And there's no fee. I just get dollar for dollar for star. I said, who figured this out? This is so great. And it goes on my Starbucks card. So now I know that was a big deal. So yeah, Starbucks cards, uh, Amazon e-gift cards. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. 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 That, so, that was, uh, that was really fun. That was really neat. fun. Yeah. Well, let me just kind of go over a couple of takeaways that I have. And if you have any to add, I'll ask you as well, too. But I just looked at uh, a couple of the key takeaways in terms of businesses and have a core strategy, uh, have a consistent message, certainly involving gratitude, um, determine the target market, uh, build a culture, which we've talked about quite a bit as well. And then I think also the Daniel Pink, I think that's really important, whether an employer or an employee, the employer should be putting these into practice and the employee should be looking for this from their boss or their employer. And that is the autonomy, the mastery and the purpose. I talked about that earlier that I had heard from other surveys, but I also liked the Gallup things too. Do they care about me? Do I get good feedback? Uh, is it like a best friend? Do they have an interest in me? And do they, and are people seeing them for something good? Because right. all of us, another thing that Brene Brown talks about is vulnerability and the ability to express. I can remember going up to employees at Nordstrom and Lowe's and just going, I have no idea. You tell, I'm the store manager. I go, you tell me you're smarter than I am. And they, what, why are you saying that? So yeah, it's kind yeah. of fun, but, but yeah, it's just, yeah. and I always think, and I, I think yours and my personalities are pretty similar. I just always really, really enjoyed managing people because 
I, I don't want to say it was like a game, but you really kind of figured out what type of employee they were. And did they, some of them don't want all the praise. Some of them are more quiet to, uh, you know, uh, people that just work behind the scenes and other ones want the praise and other ones you can have a big conversation and other ones it's short, but just figuring that out. But knowing the most important thing is making them feel good about themselves and about the job they're doing. And then everything else seems to fall in place. So, so any other little takeaways you can think of for the listeners that we might have? Well, I guess the, the only other, I guess the only other piece of that would be um, in terms of helping uh, growing faster is to sh share that gratitude with your customers, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your business. I was, I was on the phone. Uh, I don't want to know if I should, if I should mention the actual company name yesterday, but I, I had a kind of an out of body experience with customer service yesterday. I ordered a product and they sent me the wrong size and the wrong color. And Mm. I'm on the phone with the customer service person and, uh, and basically the tonality of the conversation was, so what's your problem? <laughs> right. Uh, As opposed to, Hey, thank you very much for calling. Uh, you know, what, what seems to be the issue? Why are you calling us up today? I mean, the whole, it was very perfunctory uh, and just a huge missed opportunity to, um, you know, to try and they had clearly made the mistake. It wasn't like I got the product. I didn't like it. I wanted to send it back. This was, I ordered black in this size and you sent me white in that size. Mm. And her attitude was, uh, so here's what we can do. And we can't do anything else. We can, we can send it out in a week or so, but that's the best we can do. <laughs> like, wow. Wow. Show me, uh, show me something, right? Show me some love. Say. You maybe it's the best you not say the company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Will be nice so, uh, uh, yeah, so that uh, recognizing the re recognizing the customer, catching the customer, frankly, in the act of trying to do something good and expressing gratitude, that's also an important part of the growth equation. Actually, ex excellent. One of the things I spent 15 years working with Nordstrom, and I mention this every so often, and you happen to bring that up, which I think it relates, is they would talk about the return policy and of course the customer service and just the overall, you know, way that they handle business. But one of the things that I learned from being behind the curtain uh, as a store manager, which was just fascinating that not as many people know, but as an employee, you were given 100% uh, authority to take care of any situation, however you saw fit. And if it would be like that, they sent rich, the black one, instead of the white one, they, I would say, well, if you like the black one, keep it. I'm going to send you the right one, a white one, and just keep the black one. I'm going to send you another white one. In fact, I'm going to send you a pair of socks too. And if you did that, they'd say, we only care about one thing. Is Rich Stillman happy? Is he happy? And I say, yes, they're good. And they say, next time you don't have to send him two, but you know, but you did what you thought you had to do. And I like, you never got in trouble for taking care of a customer. And right. I just thought that was so cool. I mean, it's just so neat. I, I remember going into a, a drugstore once. I had to return of all things like a toothpaste or something. I get shuffled off to the back. Get out of here. He's got to return. Get him over to the side. You know, and I had to go to another line and said, no, you, you stand right over there. Folks, let me help you over here because they were paying customers sure. and stuff. So sure. a lot sure. of different ways to skin a cat. So last question, and we'll wrap up. And thank you so much for being a great guest today. My favorite last question is, what do you know today? I know how old you are, but I'll, I'll, I'll let people guess that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you. Oh, geez. Um, I would have spent more deliberative time trying to really understand what made me tick mm. more self-introspection uh i think if i knew then what i know now that that's probably what i would have done because then it just would have been a shortcut to cut out a lot of stuff if yeah. i'd understood if i'd understood my personality better if i understood how i reacted for instance when i hit that wall in the midlife crisis if i had a better sense of what was actually going on if I understood how I made decisions and, it, it, you know, some decisions are, are obviously bad, some are good, but if I understood a little bit of the context around how I made decisions, that type of, you know, personal understanding. Um, and so, for instance, I, you know, I coach several folks these days that are in their, you know, mid to late twenties and early thirties. 
and a they're really impressive people but b so they got it they they yeah. they understand that message i'm i'm part of the process of helping them understand how to how to understand themselves better be better as they show up with their companies and they're going to be so much further ahead by the time they get to be my age than than wherever i ended up so so that's so neat yeah. and those it's one of my favorite modules in my talks is find yourself find your talent find your passion find your purpose and that relationship with yourself and really i like that it would have been spent more deliberate time with what makes me tick and that's that person in the mirror of course and it's just the sooner you get that the more of a clear understanding you have everything just works better sure and so and what you're passionate about and and that i think ultimately leads to your purpose and so that's a great comment. I like that. I've had some really interesting ones when I asked that question. So, well, I mean, at some level, you know, you're, I mean, in your earlier, in my earlier years, I was, uh, I was ambitious. And so I just was focused on, you know, what are the milestones of achieving the kind of success that I thought represented a successful person. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it was easy to not worry about what I was doing or what I was thinking, right? I was just always striving. That's my own, I don't know, my, the problem that I had or however you want to describe it. But, um, but if I'd been more thoughtful about what I was doing, mm -hmm. uh, I would have probably been happier earlier. Let's yeah. put it that way. And with both of us having children too, we can pass that message on to them too. Just here's Absolutely. something that might yeah. keep you from stubbing your toe or whatever. So <laughs> Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you. Rich. So well, that's it for this episode, everyone. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, as I mentioned earlier. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. To purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my gratitude speaking or coaching, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And also, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute, a lot of people like to get that. Just text the word gratitude guy, all one word to 22828. That's 22828. And then the message box, gratitude guy. And also an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm offering my six month proprietary uh, gratitude coaching program for the three month price. So just email me and let me know if you're interested in that. So finally, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all you listeners. And I am David George Brooks, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.